week. Uh, my guest on the Spotlight Report is Dr. Hiju Choi, who recently won the Kevin P. Thompson Optical Design Innovator Award. Uh, he won this award for an innovative UV cross dispersion space telescope uh, and also the engineering of a laser truss uh, metrology system at the Large Binocular Telescope. Um, so, Kiju, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to talk. I know you're you're very busy. Um, so, can you, before we jump into things, can you just tell people uh, kind of what your position is and what you're working on? Because I saw you're you're not only a professor, but you also work mm -hmm. at an observatory. So, yeah. By the way, it, it was so nice to meet you. So, I'm Hiju, uh, working at the College of the Optical Science and I'm also working at the Large Binocular Telescope as an optical engineer. So my work at the Sports Institute is the most likely optical engineering, but it includes uh, optical design or system simulation. And also uh, I have to I have to do the uh, hands-on stuff, such like the installation or testing on site as well. So it's really exciting job position. So <laughs> I highly recommend <laughs> if you pursuing some optical engineering, you should do the two things, the simulation and the hands-on the job. Easier, uh, easier said than done. I think even just to have the, uh, the, the desire to work in both areas. Frankly, I've, I've found a lot of people like to work in strictly simulation or design or strictly mm -hmm. hands-on. Um, so it's fun to get to work on both. Um, so the LBT, the Large Binocular Telescope, it's a unique telescope project. Um, it's located in Arizona, and what makes it, what makes it so unique? Well, first thing is the size. So, you know, every astronomer, every scientist want to have the large optics. There are two reasons. One is that they can gather many photons, means you can see really, really faint star. And the other thing is because you have the large uh, telescope, you also can uh, record very fast event as well. So for instance, if you have the small telescope, you may can see some similar image if you have the long exposure. However, long exposure means that you will lose very quick event, such like the collision or the path through the another the planet like that. So these two special team make the uh, team, uh, LBT is, is one of the very uh, interesting telescope. And also it has very unique optical layout, such like, like the binocular, mm -hmm. means the, it actually bring up some difficulty on alignment. For instance, even you point at the correct star using the two angle motion of the body, maybe these two binocular may see wrong position, like a skink. <laughs> right. So right. there are very challenging on alignment as well, but it bring up the very interesting question on to the, the optical engineers. So that's why I'm working on the LBT. Right. And and you I um we should clarify too the large part of the large binocular telescope. So these are two uh two individual mirrors that are over eight meters in diameter um that were manufactured at the, the UVA mirror lab. And <clears throat> I think one thing that makes it unique is an additional thing I should say that makes it unique is that it kind of sits in this transition area between the older generation of telescopes and this next generation of so-called extremely large telescopes. Um, not so-called, they, they are extremely large, but uh, one of them in particular, the Giant Magellan Telescope is going to use a similar approach, right, where it has several of these eight plus meter um, sub-aperture mirrors that have to be arrayed into the overall mirror uh, surface. Mm -hmm. And I think that that kind of aligns nicely with what you're saying about the large binocular telescope. Trying to align one mirror is hard enough. Trying to align two mirrors is really hard, especially when they're so large and they have this large thermal mass, they have large um, gravitational effects and things like that. So, uh, so you know, without further ado, you, you uh, you helped out on this laser truss um, metrology system. And can you tell us kind of what the, 
what what was the driving motivation? I mean, mirrors are aligned before this, right? So why did you guys need a new metrology system? Yeah. So actually, especially uh the the part I'm working on the LBT is the collimation and pointing. So the collimation and pointing is somewhat a uh, pre-step to get the real uh, science image or a pre-stage to get into the adaptive optic stage, which really control the phase. Uh, the in the this the collimation and pointing, the best uh the top priority of the this element is put the optics in correct position. And then we can try some minor adjustment to see the clear image. However, once we done with these two steps, put the correct position and then find the image, we may still see some misalignment. Due to the, the, the thermal deformation of the hub, or gravitational sag of the, this entire structure because the telescope is really heavy. Mm -hmm. So based on the telemetry, we know that this primary mirror and then the instrument place in correct position. However, they just measure with regard to the, this the solid motion. So such like even they have some relative uh, motion change between the primary mirror and all following the instrument, they don't know what is the relative position between these two. So the this the laser truss measure optics and instrument directly to determine the relative position. So the benefit of the this the metrology actually bring up the this uh resolving the ambiguity between the shape error of the M1 or the missile limit of the, these two instruments, for instance, the comma. Uh, you probably know the once you have the some opacity missile limit, you can see very strong chromatic aberration. However, your surface also can have the chromatic error when you tilt a lot. Mm -hmm. So this, the razor truss, holds the, these two positions so that any chromatic error comes from the misalignment. Then once you see any chromatic error, it truly comes from the primary mirror shape. So it removes, it, part of this metrology system is removing the ambiguity between, is it in the surface or is it in the misalignment? Yes. And also there are many ambiguities, such like the, if you, for instance, if you have some misalignment of the M1, with regard to the, the ROC of the, this M1, maybe Onesis image is good. However, Opisys image is the worst. Right, right. However, you can actually mimic exactly the situation with the somewhat combination of the missile element as well. Registrus, by keeping the relative position strictly, actually it resolve all these uh, uh, ambiguity. So mm -hmm. that is benefit. And also uh, while we are taking science image, actually we cannot evaluate misalignment by take a look at the image. So for instance, the prime focus uh, camera on ABT, they have very special functionality to measure uh, misalignment, they call it uh, FPR, focal plane image analysis. They take the inner focal image and then see the really, really tiny pupil image, basically the donut images. So because the LBT is too large, we still can see really bright donut image even <laughs> we have the misalignment. Right. Anyway, so from the, this donut, based on the intensity distribution along the, this donut or the size change or elongation, we can extract out what kind of aberration is there, what kind of misalignment is there. Means this camera just used for the FPR, not a science. And then usually FPR takes the 15 minutes or sometimes 20 minutes. So actually it uh, harm on the science time. However, the TMS, once it keep the position, it can hold the collimation quality, even you take the one hour exposure. 
So one hour exposure sounds like, yeah, you can just open the sensor. However, during the one hour, you have the following star. Mm -hmm. It changes gravitation. It change it can be changes the relative position between the your mirror and instrument. However, TMS give the feed to uh keep the depth position each other constant through the whole thing. Yep. So it, so I mean that's it to to me it sounds like that's fundamentally enabling um different scientific gathering. It's it's in improving the capabilities of the system that was already built. Yep. And also, yes, this the capability to hold the relative position give us the many information, such like the one of the very interesting is when you take a look at the very low angle star, we continuously see somewhat very specious the aberration. Mm -hmm. So the people the this TMS time, if we people we don't have the people we have the this TMS system. Uh we can just get in maybe gravitation or some of this only between M1 and follow instrument. But even TMS holds the this position, it still gives the this the very fun elongation star. So but it turns out the reflective index of the air give that elongation at the low wave, the short wave length. So such like once we right, tilt right. a lot, and then we can, the, the blue light pass through the prism like the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. And then it makes the elongation. It spreads out, right. Yeah, so actually the TMS can reserve this kind of the very fun question as well. Huh, so, so this sounds like I mean, it sounds like, and it is an incredible metrology system. It, it's um, allowing for monitoring a whole bunch of things simultaneously uh, to to great accuracy, which we'll get into. Um, so, I naturally assumed when I was reading this that uh, you guys spent months and years creating some totally new novel system, and you had to build it from the ground up because uh, how else could you do this? Um, but really, you guys bought it off the shelf. You you went to the store, you bought your metrology system. I am, you know, kind of making a joke out of it, but I think one of the one of the really brilliant things is you utilized an existing tool um, to enable enable the actual uh, laser trust laser trust metrology system. So, do you mind describing just what how, how did you make it? What are the components of this metrology system? Yeah. So uh, in order to uh, realize that this laser truss, it sounds like you have the you has to have the many laser leg. Means the you has to have the many laser leg with the distance measurement functionality. So our the TMS system actually learned by uh, the Italon, so that is manufacturer name. So they made a multi-channel absolute distance uh, measurement system. So for instance, it has the 28 channel and this 28 channel fiber routes to the, the primary meter. And then at the edge of the primary meter, we install collimator, which create the laser truss. And then on prime focus camera, they has the retro reflector. And then we measure distance between collimator to the, the retro reflector. In order to create the correct information, correct metrics to calculate the relative position, mm -hmm. we need at least the six leg. So in order to reserve the six degree of freedom, you right, need at least right. the six. And actually we gave nine channel, nine legs, in order to prepare, you know, to be on the safe side. Sometimes we lost one of the chair, or sometimes mm -hmm. if we have too much a uh, deviation from the uh, nominal position, we lost the return signal. Mm -hmm. So right. we give the nine channel. So nine channel actually look up the retro reflector and let reflector back to the, the signal. And then actually we, we measure the round trip, the distance for the every collimator. And that, and, and having those, 
like you said, I mean, having the minimum of six points, but having the the nine point uh, nine channel return lets you know the solid body, kind of the the position of the solid body in three D space, right? Mm -hmm. um, how accurate is it? The accuracy is um, some kind of the controversy because the, if you ask absolute accuracy, well, it's not that much good. However, as I said, the, the goal of the TMS is to keep the position. So it means you just need to relative position, right? So once you know that your initial, you just want to know drift from the initial right, position. Right. The accuracy is about the half micron. So and then yeah, if you just take the very short term uh accuracy. So actually the TMS also can measure the vibration board. And so if you take the vibration, you can see tens of nanometer change as well. However, we take the somewhat averaging data, so we just need relative position. So uh we trust 100 nanometer accuracy of this. However, we gave the feed about the 0 0.5 micron level only. So because right, the, right. if you think about moving of the M1 meter, the, this the 20 tons meter cannot move the 10 nanometer, 5 nanometer. But micron level is the uh, makes sense. So yeah, we do yeah. this micron level feeds to the motion. And how how fast are these measurements being taken? I mean, you're you you said that you're averaging measurements. So presumably you have enough data sets that you you're not reliant, you know, it's it's frequent enough that you you can average things, right? Yeah. So every iteration, taking the data, calculation pulse, give the motion take the almost the 20 second. Right. So 20 second is the somewhat reasonable time. So because if you think about telescope, telescope changes really slow. Yeah. Even thermal elongation, gravitational change is quite slow. So sometimes we do the some long-term average, long-term average, so that we accidentally pick up some of the outlier data. So 30 second, 20 second for every iteration is works perfect so far. However, if you want to follow in really, really fast stuff, such like uh, comet or <laughs> satellite, then we may need a much faster system. Mm -hmm. But again, this is this is kind of the first uh, system designed for this. So mm -hmm. uh, it's always it's always easier to improve upon something, I think, than to come up with the original idea. So. Yep. Uh, one of the things that popped out to me, and I, I recognize because you guys were using um, this EAMT uh, fib fiber metrology system, you didn't necessarily have the choice of this, but the metrology wave bands 1532 nanometers um, mm -hmm. and the uh, alignment lasers 633. Um, mm -hmm. So you also mentioned in your description, okay, retro reflector, no problem, it's in reflection, but there's a collimator in here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure the first thing popping out to a lot of our listeners is that's a pretty pretty big gap uh, between the wavelengths. So did this cause trouble? That's really good question. And yes, our collimator, by the way, is not a achromatic. So it's designed for the IR laser. Mm -hmm. means that when we use the visible laser for alignment, so we call it a pilot laser because it points where we are pointing. So the spot size looks like this much large. <laughs> so <laughs> very paint and that easy to see where this is. So also uh, there are some options from the manufacturer. So take uh, the Acromat lens, which has a very nice uh, polymate quality to the dispose of web ranks. However, the collimator price is about five times higher. So <laughs> we just are uh, using the off the shot collimator and we have very nice, very good people who has the amazing skill can recognize this much large big spot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And also we have the very fun couple of the very short uh, uh, projects such like the eyeglasses type lens. So for instance, for our alignment, we just put the small cap with the tiny range, which gave the really tiny visible wavelengths about the 10 nanometer away. And then we remove the disc once we put the disc collimator position somewhere in regional uh, spot. Yeah, yeah. So it was the uh, very short term student project, but uh, we didn't fabricate yet. So, so yeah. we have the, this option. So it's fun. <laughs> There's a, I would have been terrible as uh, on your team because I've, I've worked in systems before where we had a bad collimator for about, uh, for a Heaney laser source. And like you said, the, you know, the beam spreads out to a couple inches across and mm -hmm. genetically people have different amounts of rods and cones and much less uh, kind of red, red uh, cone receptors. Um, and I am terrible at seeing uh, diffuse red light. So I remember we would, we'd be doing these measurements and people would say like the beams right there. And I'd be looking at it and just, there's, you no. must be pulling my leg. So, um, yeah, by the way, telescope enclosure is amazing. It's black or the light. So once we make the dark dome, so we can see that is the red spot. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah, you don't have as much background noise. Um, mm. so, so how, how large, the 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 diameter of your collimated beam also is important. Um, did you want a smaller uh, collimated point, or did you want, or were you okay with a larger collimated beam uh, beam diameter? I should say. So I loved your question. So <laughs> this question is about the, our tolerance range of the retro motion of the retro reflector. For instance, whenever actually we want to measure motion. How, however, retro reflector move a lot. Our beam cannot come back to the our collimator. For instance, you have one millimeter, ten cent, uh, ten millimeter diameter. You have the retro reflector, and then this ten millimeter beam just hit the corner of the corner cube. Then you will see perfect signal. However, if this corner cube moved laterally, you can see exactly the same amount of the motion at the return beam. So if you think about the mechanism, when this collimator beam comes back to the fiber, the tolerance is just about the five micron on the fiber tip. Mm -hmm. And you also have to consider the focal length of the disagreements lens, but the retro reflection, retro re reflector, retro motion is not that much very wide tolerance. So we want to have large beam, large collimator, so that it can give the much higher return signal with the same amount of the motion mm -hmm. than the smaller spot. However, it is not easy to make this much larger aperture collimator, especially of the sharp quality. Mm -hmm. And also we do some uh, a strategy alignment, such like if you expect your the retro reflector motion in this way, one of the collimator and retro reflector pair expect motion this way. The other one, to the opposite direction. That's like if it moves the one direction, maybe you can lose the one of the channel signal, but the mm -hmm. other one will have the much strong signal. So we intentionally give the, this kind of the slight misalignment so that we continuously get the reasonable number of the razor truss leg. Mm -hmm. However, yes, the 10 millimeter uh, spot size actually give us about uh, millimeter retro motion of the retro reflector. So oh. it sounds like too small because the 10 meter, 8.4 millimeter, 10 meter away retro reflector, it only gave the one millimeter retro motion. Right. However, if you uh, want to make the somewhat collimation, actually we fighting with the micron level Mr. Lemon. So 10 millimeter, actually the one millimeter tolerance actually give the enough range to cut the data huh and 
I don't know. Yeah, it, it's astonishing how much things move in these large structures. I mean, one millimeter sounds tiny, but things mm -hmm. move around quite a bit. Um, yeah. So I have tons more questions about the the metrology system, but um, but you went ahead and you won the award for two different projects. Uh, yeah. So I think we should probably, for the sake of time, switch over to um, your UV um, uh, space telescope. And I, I really like the description because it's it's a mouthful. It's a UV cross dispersion space telescope. Um, mm -hmm. What's the name of this? So that we so we <laughs> we don't have to say that whole description every time. Well, so for the spectroscopy, there are many ways to get the high resolution. So for instance, if you have the one gray thing and then two collimator, you can put the, your image play very far away so that you have the really high resolution in angle. The other way is you may have the really, really high dense groove on grating so that it can deviate or diffract a lot with mm -hmm. a small amount of the wavelength change. However, these two actually not available in the space project. So this is why I put these two names, uh, the cross dispersion and UV in the, this, the title, because uh, it's really hard to realize, especially in space. Optics. Right. And, and, um, and I'm not criticizing the name, the, the name of your title. Sorry. I don't, I don't want to make it sound that way, but it's just, that I really like the name of the telescope a lot. So the, the telescope's named Hyperion, right? Yeah. Which is, which to me as a sci-fi nerd is just a, a fun name. Um, and besides the fact that it, that, I can you know what you'd incorporated hadn't been done um and in fact in your paper about this there's a great table that you have uh discussing two prior um uh, uv systems and and how they compare to hyperion which will include that image um mm -hmm. but kind of before we even get into that the fundamental question is why did we need why do we need hyperion we well, have other one, other UV telescopes, so why this, right? Yeah, first thing is uh, people never has this much high resolution uh, spectroscopy yet, especially at these uh, short wavelengths. So there are among, lots of information in spectrum. However, because of the, this difficulty, because it's too faint, or every day is the very uh, representative the spectrum place the, each other too close to each other. So because of this difficulty, people always want to have the high resolution spectroscopy at the, these wavelengths. And also, um, when people bring up the these the very short wavelength system, they always worry about the uh, throughput because the it's not easy to give you high throughput due to the, the low reflectance at these the wavelengths. Mm -hmm. So when we design this system, should we consider we have to have high resolution plus high throughput by using very special optical layout. So I, I want to say this one. So these day, the many space projects trying to focus on the very specific target. So if people are trying to put the every uh, functionality, the price is really high and the telescope has to have, has to consider many situations, mm -hmm. imaging, spectroscopy, wide field and everything service very nice service illegality and so on. However, if we just focus on the like the just the spectroscopy, then all consideration just uh, on the same line and then we really get the successful performance. So that's why high pattern is so special than that other one. So other one also do the great job. However, it doesn't really focus on the where Hyperion focus right now. Mm -hmm. And and from my reading of the paper, it sounds like Hyperion specifically is trying to look at star formation uh, mm -hmm. and, and 
kind of the key consideration in that um, is how H2 is forming and, and studying some of the molecular behavior and atomic behavior of that. And like you're saying, the signals that you're going to get, uh, even in space, are extremely small. So throughput's a huge issue. Um, and again, we'll we'll provide the, the table of this and link to the paper. But the uh, spectral resolution is kind of astonishing. It's greater than 30,000 uh, lambda over uh, delta lambda, which yeah. is crazy. Um, so the design that you came up with is um, wild, to say the least. But what do you mind kind of saying, taking me through the 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 key components and what what makes each component so unique? Because the the system at you know the entire system's unique, but every subcomponent itself is unique. So, uh, mm -hmm. do you mind just kind of describing what went into it? Sure, sure. So, um, the first uh, when people make the spectroscopy, it always offer axis layout. So, such like the slit and collimator, and then actually this collimator make the collimation beam, and then this other way deflect one direction. And then next the collimator trying to make the small spot with a wide field image, basically. Yep. So this one direction of axis, especially at the wide field situation at the second collimator, make the, a lot of aberration, especially long slit like the object. Mm -hmm. The long slit object actually has very narrow along the width, however, really wide along the slit length. Yep. In order to control the, this the all aberration, you may have to have the curved surface grating or the free point collimator. And you may have the very nice aberration control, however, it's not easy to give the high resolution simultaneously as well. So uh, we decided to use the cross dispersion and also trying to give the on axis to control aberration. So the first thing we use the HR grating right after the telescope focal plane. And then we make the center hole on the HR grating and then all the way pass through to this HR grating and then hit the collimator still on axis. And this collimator beam hit the HL still on axis. By the way, making the, this hole doesn't make the, any photon loss because the, our primary mirror already have the annular shape. Right, anyway, right. we are not going to use very center. So we just made the hole it's because all photon throughput, photon yield is matter. So. Right. So at this point in the, at this point in your design, and it, it's kind of crazy. Like if, if anyone has opened up a, a spectrometer um, or, or seen the insides, everything's on axis still. And you've lost, you've lost no light, you know, mm -hmm. outside of like reflection losses or whatever. Uh, you're not giving up anything just yet. So yep. it's column. It goes through, passes through the central hole, hits the collimator, hits the shell grating. Uh, then what yep. happens? And then this the uh, lay from the shell grating has the big angle divergence because the, we have the really, really high order on Escher grading. So the Escher grading can give the really steep diffractive angle. However, they have very short spectral, pre-spectral range. So pre-spectral, we have to understand the, what is the pre-spectral range. So such like, uh, we have, we always have the diffraction order, right? So when you use the high order, you can have the really steep diffractive angle. However, the neighboring order may have overlapping each other in mm -hmm. angle direction. So every order may give you amazing diffractive angle, very fast diffractive angle. However, each order overlap overlap and then even you pick up the one of the angle direction you will see the multiple wavelengths right right in order to uh, separate this the overlapping from the each order we use the cross dispersion 
So after all the ray hit the axial grating, then this the uh, overlap of the this diffractive angle from the each order hit the dispersion cross dispersion grating again. So on the this the cross dispersion grating, this diffractive angle is also now. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do anything originally this this uh dispersive angle, but separate this each order each each individual order right yeah right. okay and then it goes to the imaging mirror and then it comes to the uh, sensor so once you take a look at this uh the poker plane image actually you can see the three stack and then this three stack actually comes from the each order of the actual grading and uh separated by our cross dispersion grading mm -hmm. However, when we designed this the imaging system, we try to minimize number of meters so that because the even you have the really nice coating, the UV only has at this wavelength, UV only has the about the 60% reflectance. Mm -hmm. Six zero. And then if you have two, you only have the 36. Right, right. Yeah, we have the two grating, and then you can cut the so fast. So this is why we use the two free four meter to imaging the this one. So we try one meter, but you remember we have the two crazy surface, the ashel and the cross dispersion, which create the two directional wide field. And then <laughs> these two imaging plane compensate out one by one. One is actually trying to compensate out the Asia. The other one is trying to compensate out the cross dispersion. Mm -hmm. And then if we just look the this the uh, spectral system only, the HL and cross dispersion and two imaging plane, they place in same plane so that it doesn't create any uh aberration to do the off plane or off axis this one. So yeah. This the spectroscope design, so where people really like the on Hyperion. And <laughs> you uh you, you phrase it so casually. I mean the 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 design is um pretty insane for lack of a better word, but uh you brought up a lot that I, that I want to talk about. One of the key things is um, as you stated, you know, you're, you're intentionally really spreading out these, these orders as much as you can, because uh, you want to be able to have great spectral resolution. Um, and you already brought it up, but uh, you're going to get light from very steep angles. And I've been assured through my classes that when you have light through an imaging system at steep angles, you're going to get aberrations, or at the very least, you're going to have some severe distortion. So knowing this, I saw they only put two mirrors in. I mean, the other thing, I just talked to Dave Akins and, and I'm pretty sure that if I can add more surfaces in, I should be able to control aberration better. And I think you you beautifully explained that, that um, one of the biggest constraints is just how much light you have. Uh, mm -hmm. And anytime you're going to add a surface and a reflective surface, especially in the UV, you guys just didn't have that, um, that in the, in, you know, in the system tolerances, um, yeah. which is... It's so always one of my favorite quotes uh, from the late Dr. Grievenkamp was, if you ever think you have enough photons, you're wrong. You don't. <laughs> um, um, so what kind of, uh, so, so you, you explain why you're space, con space constrained and light constrained. So you only go with two mirrors. Um, are these just, in, and they're compensating respectively the shell and the cross dispersion grading. Are these just any old mirrors, or I mean, is there something? There is something unique about them. So, can you say what what makes them unique? Uh unique on the as a space project wise. So, yes, and so and the, the shape itself too. Yeah. So the was when they uh bring the when actually ask me the. The, the spectros spectroscope system, they ask uh, actually uh, the size, the length of this system. So because uh, the long propagation right after deflective optics actually give the better resolution, but they don't want to use that because of the, the 
ranks a constraint. And the other one is they also want to have a certain resolution regarding their sensor pixel size as well. So we have to meet a certain spot size on the detector. And also they actually want to minimize number of optics. One is the cost, second is photon yield, and third is the weight of this system because we already have the really large primary meter in front of this spectroscope. Mm -hmm. And then, so yeah, that, that is the all request from the science team. And also they want to have reasonable diffractive performance with the design by using the the blaze angle design. Mm -hmm. So the when you design the grating, actually you can design the blaze angle so that you have the high efficiency at a certain diffractive order. Uh, but uh, it cannot exceed the available uh, facility resolution. So like the, even we designed all these the, within the one picometer resolution, people never, never, never make the distance. So we have to consider the affordable the technique as well. Mm -hmm. and, and then, yeah, so it, yeah, it doesn't include in this paper. However, we also have to consider the difficulty of the alignment and install and testing process as well. So we should provide some reasonable step which can confirm every step is correct. But we kind of the hesitating to explain a lot at this point because the two cross dispersion and two free per meter will give us significantly <laughs> difficult step to confirm that this alignment. But one good thing is they never ask diffract limit performance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we have the reasonable slit image, basically the spectroscope is always re-imaging your slit without right, right. too much broadening yep. on spectrogression. So actually they uh, are pleased with the, this the reasonable slit image. They said good so, enough. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> enough. That's, that's <laughs> enough. So even we yeah, so as an optical engineer, if you see that this spot is so ugly, so yeah, yeah, this spot is elongated the one direction and then in random shape. But if you see the entire slit image, it looks good. So, so we don't worry about that. yeah. How did you, how how did you analyze whether or not um, the design was good enough? You know, before you go and build this entire thing, there's there's a lot to consider. Like you're saying, are are the optics um, are the optics shaped appropriately so that your image of the slit is going to not be too aberrated? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, is the diffraction grading chosen appropriately? Um, so just starting with the optics, how how is that analysis done? There is two ways, and then we also meet that is two way as well. So one is the geometrical analyze. So it's like we shoot the ray, which just uh, fill the our slit, mm -hmm. and then see the image on the detector, and then we shoot the exactly same ray, but wavelength difference is about thirty thousand spectral resolution. It's about zero point zero zero five picometer. Mm -hmm. And then these five picometer difference wavelengths make the another slit image on the detector. And if these two slit image doesn't make the too much overlap each other, then we confirm the performance in geometrically. Mm -hmm. The other one is uh, actually we do the uh, physical wave propagation to consider diffractive optics performance. 
So this, the diffractive optics has the difference of uh, efficiency at angle, at wavelength, at order. And we, when we do the this analyze in ZMAX or code five, it just take the single order. However, once we propagate this order array in physical wave propagation, we can see all spectra overlapping on the detector plane, all order, all spectrum simultaneously. And then if you pick up the one pixel of the detector, and then if only include one field image, one spectral image, one spectral information, then we confirm, oh, it works correctly. However, if you pick up the one pixel and that it include many spectral information or many field information, then it definitely means that they are overlapping each other. Yeah, right? too much, so, right. Yeah, that is the, the other way. But the second one is, how can I say, much more uh, significant work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you may need to non sequential ray trace, and that also has to have the very detailed uh, design of the grating so that mm -hmm. you consider efficiency of the depression in wavelengths and diffractive angle and order. So hmm. it's not easy. Yeah. So it's, uh, uh, it, we didn't talk about the uh, straight light yet. So I, the... you, I was about to ask. Um... You're you're already trying to not throw out light because you're so light starved in the UV, uh, but there's other wavelengths out there and there's other light. So how much of a nightmare was stray light? Um, that would be crazy. <laughs> so <laughs> so because um, the grating surface itself creates a lot of the stray light. So because mm -hmm. the old edge cannot have the super clear edge. It always yeah. have some it's not perfect. Right, yeah. right. Even we make the really nice mirror, the four nanometer RMS surface smooth mirror create the scatter light. But the, this the grating made the the sharp knife edge shape, uh, sharp the the so tight. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot. Yeah. And then it followed diffraction low. And then this catalyte has some wavelengths. They have a certain direction. And if it just the pointing our interesting angle, we can pick up the, this, the straight light as our signal. And then once it uh, reached our detector plane, actually there is no way to distinguish what wavelength it is. Mm -hmm. So in simulation, we know, but once we make the decision, we don't know. Uh, we really doesn't have a chance to do the, this the straight light analysis because um, it's uh, meaningless to assuming how much scatter light we receive from the uh, diffractive optic before we have it. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can simulate based on the roughness. So smooth surface or the just a flat surface, but ground surface, has the amazing model which can expect what kind of straight light coming from. Right. However, the, this kind of a crazy structure doesn't have model. So we actually have to do the DRDF test in order to oh, wow. check, yeah, in order to see uh, what diffractive uh, behavior is there. However, one good thing is we don't have to do the this the BRDF test in these wavelengths. Huh. We just can do the some the visible wavelengths, and there are very nice the model which can convert visible wavelengths behavior into the UV. The UV, okay. Yeah. Huh. Um. Well, again, I I have uh kind of endless more questions I'd like to ask, but I know I know you've got to get going at eleven. So, um, so I have just a few questions from other people that that they wanted me to ask. So, mm. one of them is um. When you got into optics originally, did you have the idea that you would be um, working on stuff at, at this level, working on space-based uh, or you know, uh, telescope systems that are going into space or uh, cutting-edge metrology systems that'd be 
you know, winning awards when you first started? Was that mm -hmm. something that you thought, yeah, this is my kind of trajectory? Well, uh, it, it is worth to <laughs> audit that. Uh, actually, I am very, how can I say, I'm really lucky. So because my PhD is the physics, actually, I studied uh, nonlinear optics. And at that time, my goal was the finding new laser material. <laughs> For that, so, I so perfectly aligned with this, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but I can say, at that time, I loved my calculation and I loved that study. Actually, it bring me the many chance. So whenever I have to find the next career, whenever I want to see some new thing, actually people suggest a lot of the opportunity. So they gave a the lot of, they offered lots of opportunity. And then actually I select five years ago, I select uh, one of the job. Actually it works with Dale. And then Dale gave me, we have the, this, 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 this uh, mission, you, what you want to do. And then I <laughs> select this and select that. And then all this the opportunity actually uh, kind of the lucky, but if you don't like it, or if you really not enjoying the your stuff, maybe people hesitating to offer this kind of the crazy situation is crazy or the amazing the project because it actually required the lots of effort. And then always you have to study new things. And then in order to get confidence with your research, actually you have to study more than your PhD course. Yeah. So yeah. whenever I got, whenever I take the new offer, actually I feel like, oh, I don't know almost the 30% of the this. <laughs> I study new stuff, but uh, this is the some benefit in academia or some difficulty in academia. So you have to study new thing every time, but actually it definitely leads you very interesting or very amazing missions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like I, I like that answer a lot. Uh, so what the next question someone wanted me to ask was, what are you most excited about uh, in optics for the future? Actually, I'm really interested in fabrication these days. So I saw many interesting idea still bound onto the fabrication capability. Mm -hmm. So if we can find some easy way or much cheaper way to create the courage optical surface, then it will open the many potential crazy idea, especially in industry or the academia or astronomy as well. Actually, it can open the very new world. However, if you think at least a five meter class meter, you it's not easy to make OAP as well. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So people always start from the spherical and it's the hyperbola or parabola not a free form. And also in industry, especially sography, people want to have the really nice the performance, the sography system, which has the perfect performance in very short wavelengths. However, they are uh, hesitating to make the crazy optics because the you has to have the really nice accuracy at that wavelength. And then there is no range, right? So if you think about very short wavelengths, there is no range to transparent the wavelengths. So yeah, only mirror yeah. is available, means the 10 nanometer error, 20 nanometer wavefront error, <laughs> then that is the crazy, the 
typical T on the mirror design, especially UV. So yeah, if we can do the summer fabrication, a nice way to release the disk fabrication uh, technique for the preform or any kind of stuff, or the material can be the one of the good answer because the people are trying to 3D print of the optics, but we don't have really nice the material to 3D printing mm -hmm. yet mm -hmm. for the optics. So yeah, I'm really inter interested in the fabrication. Hmm. You think, yeah. Uh, and eventually, yes, we have to collaborate a lot of the field because the some people already know the answer, but they don't know what demand in this field. Exactly. It's it's always astonishing to me how I mean, even when you look at sometimes other fields currently or even sometimes in the past, how they've they've come up with solutions to problems that they didn't know existed. Um, mm -hmm. So collaboration is definitely key. Uh, well, I've, I've taken up slightly more of your time than I promised. So, uh, Hiju, thanks so much for taking the time to talk. Um, and I'll, uh, I'm sure I'll be seeing you soon, but do you have any last, uh, last thoughts or words you wanted to, to, to share with anyone? Well, so you guys, I believe, uh, pretty enjoying the James app portal these day. Yes. So our new generation, I believe pretty can use the, the, this kind of the high resolution image and the very old light from the deep star as my generation is quite can use to the Hubble image. So mm. for the next generation, we will keep working to defeat the James Webb. So maybe you can see the two times larger or maybe you can see the Big Bang image at some point. Right. So, yes, we will work on this and then yeah, I'm also looking forward to see the yeah. better than James F. Please. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, Hiju, thanks so much. Uh, yeah.